Is the United States mentioned in prophecy? Well, it's a question that our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, was asked many, many times throughout his ministry. And although he never found a prophetic statement that directly related to the United States, he certainly did see similarities between our nation and those mentioned in Old Testament prophecy. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word. And today we'll hear more about the nations that resemble the United States as our study continues in the book of Daniel, beginning today at chapter 8. So, grab your copy of God's Word and find your seat on the Bible bus. And while you do, let's welcome Greg Harris in the studio. Hey, Greg. Hey, Steve. Good to see you. And it's good to see you as well. You're back from a long trip to Asia. so I am. Yeah, Steve, it was an exciting trip. Uh, the, the purpose of the trip was to travel to a couple parts of Asia, but the one I really want to emphasize is we went to Chiang Mai, Thailand, to train uh, four new production teams for potentially four new languages through the Bible in that part of the world. Wow, that is really exciting. Now, talk about what that looks like. What do we What do we start once we get these people in a room and say, okay, here's what we're going to do? Well, I have a maxim. You know, I have a lot of maxims, and yeah. one of them is every through the Bible language is a miracle. When you really dig into the logistics and the providence of God to yeah. get the right people uh, at the right time who are able to do these these very, very difficult projects, the first thing was just getting the right people in the room. And we ended up having about 20 people because of the four languages. Each language brought anywhere between two and four people. And then there were some other administrative people from FEBC, our partner there in that region. And so we get all 20 people in the room. And then I spoke to them all day long, teaching them basically how we do through the Bible and other languages. Now, we have a well-established process for that. Uh, It's been tested over time. We have a 46-page manual that we leave with them. But as you know, you've done this before. I spoke through a translator from English into Thai, which is the main language of Thailand. But then the people hearing this were actually listening in Thai, but their mother tongue is other languages like Yumian, Mon, Mong, and Kamu. Those are the four languages. Yeah, yeah, you you could say that. But it it shows you these languages are very unfamiliar to us. And the story behind that, Steve, is that many of these languages have, and I'm going to say only, only a million people or so. Relatively small. Relatively small. But imagine if you had the chance to bring the Word of God to people who have nothing else in their language. And in these languages, I heard some of the people that I met told me of their excitement to get Dr. McGee's systematic teaching. Yes, they have preaching. Yes, they have some Bible teaching. But really, uh, the passion, what I want to carry back to all of us is the passion that these people have Mm -hmm. to take Dr. McGee's content and to respect it. And that's a key thing because we are very, very clear that they must not change the theology. Right. They've got to get through key points and they've got to make it contextualize. A lot of people initially think, oh, you go into a different language, you just simply hire a translator (laughs) and they take what's on the page, Dr. McGee's transcript and translate it. It is much more than that. And it is. And I often say to people, one of the reasons I believe God has so blessed our global ministry is that we keep Dr. McGee's theology, but we allow the local hearers to hear it as a local program. We actually tell them that. We don't want the Camus speaking uh, people who are hearing our broadcast think that this was a Western broadcast. Yeah. And maybe our listeners here in the U.S. don't know this, but I love telling people this about Dr. McGee. He made it clear his name never needed to appear in mm-hmm. the foreign translations. And so yeah. there are millions of people listening to Dr. McGee's teaching who don't literally know who he is. Isn't that yeah. a wonderful statement yeah. of how humble he was? Yeah, absolutely. Greg, why don't you pray for us? And before you begin, how should people be praying for the ministry as it goes into all these languages? First of all, pray that we find the right people and the right speaker. That is the most important thing. Secondly, pray that they would have the capacity to do a project of this magnitude. Even people that have done radio for a long time are just overwhelmed by 1,300 programs. And, And those really are the two key things. Okay. So let's pray now. Great. Heavenly Father, we are just amazed that you allow us to have a small part in taking your whole word to the ends of the earth. Thank you for these new doors of opportunity. We pray you'll bless every one of those projects and that you'll give us the right people and that they'll have the capacity to do the full Through the Bible program in their own language and that millions of people would be blessed. Bless us now as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, last time we put down the foundation to this chapter 8 of Daniel. 
And very frankly, friends, this is one that's neglected. We're going to move rather rapidly through it because largely it's already been fulfilled. But actually, that ought to make it all the more remarkable to us. And therefore, let's get right into it. We have what is called the vision of the ram and he goat. Verse 1, we have now the time and place of this vision. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Now this is the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, and it places this vision as the other toward the end of the Babylonian Empire, for Belshazzar was the last king. Now, chapter 7 that we just looked at, that was given in the first year of his reign. Now, verse 2, And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. In the vision, Daniel finds himself at Shushan, which is Susa, the capital of Media Persia, which actually was the second world empire. And he was in the palace. More accurately, he was near the fortress. And Uli is the Kirkhar River, which flowed by Susa. Now, the reason for the setting of the vision being at Susa rather than Babylon is that this vision concerns the second and third world empires. The events foretold in this vision were all fulfilled within 200 years. Now, such fulfillment is so remarkable that the liberal critic, as we've indicated before, he insists upon a late dating of Daniel. That is, he maintains that Daniel was written after these events had transpired, and so is merely a historical record. In an attempt to get rid of the miraculous, which is, of course, embarrassing to the liberal system of interpretation. Now, will you notice here in verses 3 and 4, we have the vision now. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, I stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now, let me pause there at the end of verse 3 to identify the ram here. The ram had two horns. Now, that's Media Persia. It says that the horn that came up last was higher than the other. In other words, the Median came up first. It was Gabras, the Median general, that destroyed Babylon. And then later, the Persian monarchs, they gained the ascendancy over the Median, and they took the kingdom, this great empire, to its heights so that the ram now here with two horns, one horn that's more prominent than the other, it's the media Persian empire with the Persian being in the ascendancy. Now, verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now, do you notice the directions in which he moved? I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward. Now, why doesn't it say that he's pushing eastward? Well, that's where he was in the east. The Persian Empire was right on the door of civilization of that day. You'd open the door, you'd step into the Orient, of course, India and China. And at that time, this was where the action was. And so he's moving in every direction. He is projecting this empire out in all different directions. Now, we find here that this is the Persian Empire, and that's the bear in the seventh chapter. Now, it's a ram that's put before us because it serves the purpose. Now, he pushes north and west and south. And the Persians were all motivated by the spirit of conquest 
I think that was true of all of them. And then we have now the other side of the vision, the rough goat with one dominant horn, and he destroys the ram. Now will you notice this? Verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west, that is, out of Europe now, on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, this is a one-horn goat, a unicorn. Now, Daniel was marveling at the power and the ability of the ram. But yonder in the west, there came a goat, and with great movement, and he had a dominant horn. Now, that goat represents Greece. And if you doubt that, you just turn over with me to verse 21. We read this, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that's between his eyes is the first king, and that was Alexander the Great. Now, we are able to identify this pretty easy here. What happens is Persia attempted to move into the west, and under Xerxes, that effort was made. But out of the west, there comes this goat, and he's moving so fast, he doesn't even touch the ground. That speaks of the four wings, you remember, that was on the panther, the leopard. And it speaks of Alexander the Great. Now, let's keep moving. Verse 6 and 7. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him. And, of course, that means he was moved with anger and great hatred against him. And, actually, he ran into him in order to destroy him. And I saw him come close unto the ram, moved with choler, with hatred, with anger against him. And he smote the ram, broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Now, Xerxes was really the last great ruler of the Media persian Empire, and he made a foray against Europe, against Greece. And he was moving, my gracious, 300,000 men with their families. And the Greek soldiers were smart. They didn't go out to meet him. They waited until he got to Thermopylae. Well, that was a narrow pass. And you couldn't put a big army in there. But one Greek soldier was equal to at least 10 of the media Persian, because actually they were not a trained, disciplined army as the Greeks had. So the Greeks were able to get the victory at Thermopylae. They just had to change shifts there and take care of that tremendous army as they attempted to advance a few at a time through the pass. And then at Salamis, the fleet of Xerxes was destroyed by a storm, 300 vessels. Xerxes, as we've seen before in the book of Esther, he actually had a few bats in his belfry too. That's been characteristic of the rulers of the world. When the word was brought to him that his fleet had been destroyed, by a storm, he went down and took off his belt and he beat the waves because they had destroyed his fleet. Now, that, I would say, is not the mark of an outstanding, intelligent man by any means. Well, anyway, that was the last effort that the East made to move toward the West. They never were able after that to make any great dent. Now, it's true that the great Hordes of Muhammad, the Muslim forces, came up through Spain, the Moors, but Charles Martel stopped them at the Battle of Tours. And it's true that they attempted the Turks coming up through the east, through the Balkans. They made a stab at it, but it failed. But actually, this was the last great effort of a great world empire. And now there rises in the West this tremendous general, a young man. He was just 33 years of age when he died. He was a military genius, probably the greatest. 
and he was moving his army with great speed. He could move a power-striking force probably quicker than any other man, any other general's been able to do. Now will you notice what happens here, and I'm reading verse 8. We are told, therefore, the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, what was it that broke this horn? There was no power that could break it. We are told that when he came to power, the whole world was under the heel of Alexander the Great, and Tradition says that he sat down and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. He had conquered the then known world. Well, he had died one night because he was seized by a fever after a night long drinking bout, and he died in Babylon in the year 323 BC. And he was 33 years when he was strong. The great horn was broken. Now, we have had before us three great world empires, Babylon, the Media Persian, and the Greek Empire. All three went down in a drunken orgy, by the way. Drink was the determining factor. Now, I said I would be coming back to this. I asked some time ago for statistics on the use of alcohol in our nation, And I found out that the thing to do when I need somebody to do research, I'm going to ask you folk to do it. I've gotten some wonderful information. Now, let me say that our nation today, I do not think will be destroyed by marijuana or heroin, but alcohol will destroy us. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not for legalizing marijuana, and I think the drug traffic is a grave danger. But while we're so busy on that front, we've forgotten that alcohol destroys nations, and it's destroyed nations in the past. Now, here are some statistics that are alarming. They ought to be. Almost half of the 55,000 deaths on the U.S. highways and streets were the result of alcohol drinking. In other words, 27,000 highway deaths related to alcohol consumption. That means that in two years, more people are killed by alcohol than in Vietnam. And we had a lot of protests, movements. People carried banners. When did you see your last banner with somebody carrying a whiskey bottle on it and saying, this is the real danger to America today? But they don't do that, do they? Because there are too many people drinking liquor. And it's estimated that 9 million American workers, now these are people who hold jobs, are alcoholics. And I'm told that 450,000 of them are right here in Los Angeles County. It's the reason that practically every morning on the freeway, there are accidents and many deaths. So that today, this is alarming. $15 billion is spent annually for liquor. And we are seeing that this tremendous number, and that doesn't include a great many women and a great many people that are not working who are alcoholics. May I say to you, this great empire of Alexander the Great went down because he was an alcoholic. He conquered the world, but he couldn't conquer Alexander the Great. And the grave danger today in Washington is not the Democrats or the Republicans, yet I'm of the opinion that both of them present a problem today. But the big problem is the cocktail parties over which decisions of our government are made. That's alarming, friends. Why do we think that we're something special? There are a certain group of people that think the United States happens to be God's little pet. And there are others today that assume that we are so superior intellectually and evolution has produced us and we just happen to be at the top of the totem pole and there's not a chance of us going down. My friend, it's time somebody's blowing the whistle and saying 
that we're on the way out. And if I read prophecy right, we're on the way out. Now, will you notice that when Alexander the Great went out, what happened? Well, his empire was divided among four men, four generals. Cassander, who had married Alexander's sister, he took Europe, that is Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus, he took Asia Minor, which is the greater part of modern Turkey. And Seleucus, he took Asia and all the eastern part of Alexander's empire but Egypt. And then Ptolemy, he took Egypt and North Africa. Now, verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. What's the pleasant land? Israel. Now, this was the Seleucidae monarchy or dynasty that took Syria. He attempted to take the land of Israel. And the one that's mentioned here, this little horn, he was Antiochus the fourth, or Epiphanes. He was son of Antiochus the Great. And sometimes he's called Epimenes, the madman. Here we go again with these demented rulers. And he came to the throne in 170 B.C., and he made his attack upon Jerusalem, and it was against him that the book of Maccabees, that the Maccabees were raised up. And anti-Semitism was at the core and heart of this man. And he placed an image of Jupiter in the holy place, and that was the first abomination of desolation because he took swine and boiled a pig and took the broth and put it on all the holy vessels. Now we're told in verse 10, it waxed great even to the host of heaven, cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon him. This statement is admittedly difficult of interpretation. I think the natural interpretation is that Antiochus challenged God and he was permitted to capture Jerusalem and the temple. And for that reason, there was a warfare that was a spiritual warfare, where I think demonic and heavenly power was involved. There's a great deal we don't know yet, friends. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, he was a devotee of Jupiter, and he chose for himself the title Theos Epiphanes, that is, God manifest. Now, verse 12, And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by a reason of transgression. That is, it was by the permissive will of God that this little horn practiced and prospered during this period. Now, verse 13, we're told, and I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? All right, how long was this awful blasphemy? How long was it to last? All right, now, we're going to find out next time how long it was to last and the conclusion of all of this, which is one of the most remarkable prophecies because it's already been fulfilled. And it's been very hard for the humanists, the rationalists, the unbeliever to accept this. It's been very hard for him to swallow. But this just happens to be an example of fulfilled prophecy. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Are you as amazed as I am by the accuracy of Daniel's prophecies? Of course, we know that God is behind everything, and he knew the outcome of history even before he created this world. But isn't it awesome to watch it unfold right before our eyes? For more great teaching in the book of Daniel, I recommend you download Dr. McGee's booklet titled Stand Up. As we travel the pages of Daniel chapter 1, Dr. McGee shows us what it takes to stand up for what's right and then have courage in the face of evil, just like Daniel did. You know, it's not easy, but Daniel shows us that it is doable, even in the face of what seems like insurmountable obstacles. Stand Up is just one of the more than 100 of Dr. McGee's booklets that we offer for free download in the resources section of ttb.org. 
or if we can suggest another Bible study resource by Dr. McGee, please give us a call at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you call, be sure to tell us how you listen to Through the Bible, whether it's online or through our apps, on your local Christian radio station, or maybe even on YouTube. However you hear us, we'd certainly love to know how. This little bit of information, as we've mentioned before, is a big help when it comes to stewarding the resources that God provides through faithful friends like you. If you want to listen online or see if your station carries the Sunday sermon, you can visit ttb.org. Now, be sure to join us when the Bible bus comes back around your corner on Monday. And until then, strengthen yourself in His Word and keep looking to Jesus in every issue of life. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.